Amen. Why don't you take your Bible, turn to Luke chapter 4, if you would, please. Luke chapter 4 this morning. Appreciate that, Alicia. Man, I love you. I love this church. I do. I love this church. I thank God for it. And uh, the things that we allow God to do uh, in our church, in our service. And uh, I love you folks online. I really do. A lot of you have reached out, made contact with us here. And uh, either by phone or by letter, by email, message or whatever. And uh, I thank God for you folks. And, uh, and think about you when I'm, when I'm praying, uh, when I'm seeking the Lord about what to preach, what to talk about, what to, what to do, uh, any given thing. Uh, the Bible taught me a great lesson one time, and that is the shepherd is to know the state of his flock. And that means he's to, he's to seek God and find out what his, what his sheep need. And uh, what it is that they stand in need of. Sometimes it's, uh, sometimes we need encouragement. Sometimes we need blessing. Sometimes we need healing. Sometimes we need correction. And sometimes we just need, you know, and don't don't know what it is. But uh, I thank God that He's always able to supply the need uh, through this church. Luke chapter four. Are you there? Say Amen. Now I was there last week. And uh, didn't really plan on preaching out of this again this week, but it fits in with uh, something that God uh, kind of laid on my heart. And uh, I'm going to be talking about some serious, serious issues. And I realize that probably most of everybody that I'm talking to this morning is, if I were to ask you, are you saved, would you say amen? Okay, I get that. Those of you online... Okay, I hear it, and um, but it's it's highly possible, highly possible that as long as we live in this world and live in the flesh that we inhabit, that there are some things that have yet to be conquered and or dealt with in our life, and. God wants to deliver us. And I said us. Okay, I'm not preaching down to anybody. All right? I'm preaching, sometimes you notice them down here, sometimes up here. It just depends on how I feel sometimes. And sometimes it depends on what I know I'm going to say. And if I think I'm going to say something that's going to trigger you, I'll duck down here. This is all bulletproof lid right here. And... No, I'm just kidding. Luke chapter 4, verse 16. Are you there? He came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. By the way, let me, let me stop right here and let me tell you who I got, who I got in trouble by. Uh, Michael came to me and he said, uh, he said there were visitors that came to the radio station. Was it in Turkana? Yeah. And he said they were Seventh-day Adventists. And the Seventh-day Adventists are very thick. In Kenya, they have a lot of. Ch I noticed, you know, going from town to town, traveling through Kenya, there's a lot of Seventh Day Adventist uh, churches out there, and um, so they came to the radio station in a group. How many were there, Mick? Do you know? Okay, but just a group of them, of men, probably pastors, and they all got together and decided they would come down to our radio station and demand that that guy that's talking on the radio station shut up and quit speaking against the Seventh-day Adventists, quit speaking against the commandments and probably hurled all kinds of accusations against me. And Perkins is the man that's running our station out there, told him, he said, well... He owns the station, so he can pretty much say whatever he wants. And that was the end of the meeting. Okay? But let me tell you, in case you don't understand this, Seventh-day Adventist is not just like a different breed of Baptist or something like that. They claim extra-biblical revelations were given to, um, what's her name? Huh? Ellen White. 
They claim that she had extra biblical revelations where God showed her that the fourth commandment was that we have to go to church on Saturday. The fourth commandment is honor, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And I've had people bring this to me over the years because they like, because I deal with prophecy. The Seventh day Adventists are big on prophecy, so they'll listen to me when I talk about prophecy. But then I've gotten letters, and in fact, I got one the other day saying, How is it you know so much about the Bible and, don't go, and you guys go to church on that pagan Sunday? And you're all honoring the pagan God instead of the real God of the Bible. How come you know so much Bible and don't know that? And I wrote them back and I said, you show me. You show me one place in the Bible where I am, I am commanded to go to church only on one day a week or I'm prohibited from going any other day. And I said, the fourth commandment does not say either one. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou do all thy work and thy labor, but the seventh day thou shalt rest. Resting is how we remember the Sabbath day, not going to church. It does not say that. Okay? But these people hinge salvation on going to church on Saturday. If you go to church on Saturday, you're saved. If you do not and go on Sunday... You're not saved because you've changed the Bible. You've changed the law of God. We didn't change anything. We didn't add to it. We didn't take it away. We just looked at it and said, you know what? I think I ought to rest today. And I, I did. I wrote one lady back and I said, how do you know what I did on Saturday? How in the world do you know what I do on Saturday? And I told her, I said, on Saturday, I rest. It's what I do. Normally, I don't come to the church on Saturday. I take my day off and I rest. But they make a big deal about this, and they didn't want me saying it on radio station. I'm going to, I'm going to say it more now. Okay? Because people need to be delivered from bondage, the bondage of the law, to the grace of Jesus Christ. Okay? So, Michael, uh, there's, there's no... I got this in my... I've actually got this in my notes for today. And he just told me about it this morning. So what made me think about it was Jesus went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. So um, where are we at? Verse 17. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And I want you to notice now what he's saying. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. To preach deliverance. Underline that. Preach deliverance to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, then to set at liberty them that are bruised. So we're preaching, there's a couple things out of this that I'm focusing on this morning. Preaching uh, the gospel, um, he preached deliverance to the captives and set at liberty them that are bruised. And then to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Now Jesus is quoting this from Isaiah 61. I have it up there on the screen. But you can open up to Isaiah 61 in your Bible. Make a note, Luke chapter 4, and Jesus is reading from that. The Spirit of the Lord, this is what Isaiah said. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. And he hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. And then he said to proclaim liberty to the captives. And the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Now I'm going to ask you a very serious question this morning. What is it that you are bound by? What is it? Now I'm not asking you if you are in bondage. Not asking that. I'm asking what it is that you're in bondage to. Because I've got it figured that if you live in this world... With the body that you've got, the flesh, wicked, sin nature that you have, there is something that's holding you, that's got you in bounds and chains. And God has designed humans to not like to be bound up. Who in here is claustrophobic? Got a couple of you. Don't like MRI machines. Okay, don't like them. They're going to crash down on you one of these days and smother you to death, aren't they? Which never happens. 
Okay? But that's, that's a real legitimate fear. But God has put in all of us a desire to be set at liberty, to be free. Ask anybody in prison. You want to be let out? Sure, I don't want to be in here anymore. I don't want to go back. Okay? So this morning, I'm just, I'm, let's just get aware of ourselves this morning. Let's get aware of who we are. Don't think about who, don't think about your neighbor. Don't think about somebody sitting next to you. Don't think about somebody you're mad at this morning. Think about yourself, what you're in bondage to. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, I ask your help. Your blessing, dear God, your guidance. And Lord, I just ask God that you preach this uh, to those that would hear it. Lord, I don't know these people the way you know. I don't see them, Lord, every day of the week. I don't see everything that they do and say. And I don't see everything, every part of their life like you do. But God, you know them. You know them, Lord, that Sometimes we get in bondage and we've been in it so long, we've just decided that that's how it is and that's how it's going to be. And sometimes, Lord, we don't even ask for help anymore. What a shame. God, you came and you opened that book and you said to us that you're here to preach deliverance to us. So, Lord Jesus, I'm asking you to preach deliverance to your people this morning. Set them free. Get them out of the bondage that they either put themselves in because of their own foolishness. Or, Lord, maybe it's just a, a very well laid snare by the devil. Got them snared and there they are and they, they're still there and they don't know how to get out. So God, teach us your ways and open our eyes dear God and give us hope. Because the only thing worse than being in bondage, wanting out, is being in bondage and not wanting out anymore. And God, I don't want to be that way. And I don't want these people to be that way. And you don't want them that way. God, you've made us better than that. You've given us better examples than that. Your word is higher than that, Lord. So, Father, I'm praying, dear God, that you'll set some people free today. If not today, do it in a week, do it in a month, do it in a year. Lord, however you do it, set your people free. Lord, bless your word. You preach it today. That way, people give you the glory and the praise and the honor. Or maybe if they're upset, Lord, they just get upset with you. But Lord, just preach this Bible today and preach it good and straight to all of us. Lord, I need to hear it too. So Lord, we just pray, dear God, that you visit with us today, both here and visit with the folks online. Lord, some of them are listening today that I, I know, Lord, things that they have told me, things they've written to me and told me. And Father, I pray, dear God, that you deliver them today. If not today, then give them a token or a sign that you will deliver them and you don't break your promises. So bless your word today, we pray in Jesus' name. And all the God's people said, Amen. Amen. Romans chapter 8, if you want to turn there, I believe that there is a spirit or spirits associated with the weaknesses and the, and the chains and the, that and the bonds that have trapped you today. There are spirits behind this. And I want you to think about when Israel was in bondage. They weren't in handcuffs every day. They were not chained down or put in prison every day. Israel was in bondage in that the Egyptians had removed every way possible for them to defend themselves. And then their taskmasters came out and they put them to cruel labor, cruel bondage, so that they had to do whatever the taskmasters told them to do. And what, what, the, it, what the Israelites were ended up doing was they ended up building two cities for Pharaoh out of stone. They, they, were, they were working in the quarry or they were working on 
prepping the ground or they were working on making bricks or they were somehow some kind of labor. But it was not labor for themselves and their family. It was labor for Pharaoh. And here's why I'm saying this. Normally, when you are in bondage, it's not that you're thrown in prison somewhere and can't get out. Normally, you are serving Satan. You are serving his kingdom and working for him somehow, some way. Now, I'm just going to ask you a, a real easy question. Who in here thinks the devil deserves you serving him? He don't deserve it. He don't deserve to get anything from me. I owe him nothing. I owe God everything. Amen? You ought, to, you ought to get to a place in your life where you can honestly look right up to heaven and say, God, everything that I have, including my family, is yours. You take it how you want it. I want to tell you what. God will bless you. God will make you free. Mm. But normally when you're in bondage, you're not just tied up and can't do anything. You're serving Satan. So I don't, I don't understand that, Brother Mike. Explain that to me. Well, let's say that, let's say that maybe, uh, maybe one of you is still taking a little nip of whiskey every now and then. You got a bottle hid in the, your truck. And there's some old guy, maybe your neighbor, maybe somebody you work with. He's been kind of watching you because he knows you go to church, but he's thinking about maybe getting himself in church, and he's a little whiskey drinker too. And the devil set it up one day where you went out to the truck and pulled your bottle out from behind the seat and took a little drink of it, and there he was standing about 10, 15, 20 yards away. You didn't see him, but he saw you. And right then and there, that shut his mind down about ever going to church. And he'll die lost. You just serve Satan's kingdom. See what I'm getting at? Pharaoh, had, Pharaoh didn't deserve to be blessed by the Israelites, by have these two cities built for him. He did, he did not deserve that. And they despised Pharaoh. They hated him. And they want it out. And you'll get to a place, maybe, where you'll want out. So, there's a spirit behind this, as part of it, making sure that you are never free. Making sure you're never free. Let me give you another story. This is a, this is a true story. Back years ago... God knew that he had plans of, uh, he's going to start sending me out preaching to different churches. Brother Mike Hutzel was out spreading my name everywhere, handing out my book and tapes and stuff like that to preachers. And every place Mike Hutzel would go, about five, six months later, I'd be at that same church doing a little prophecy seminar, King James Bible thing. And at the time, my wife was working up here at Blue Cross. And she had always felt uh, that... Maybe she ought to quit working up there and come down and be, be next to her husband, be close to her husband. And every time she would get that thought in her mind, she'd tell me about it. And I'd, I'd want to be like the nice liberal husband. Honey, that's your decision. I'm not going to interfere in that. But really what it was, I was enjoying the money she was making. So I didn't really want her to quit. And lo and behold, every time she thought about quitting there, they gave her a raise. Not kidding you. They'd give her a promotion and a big raise. And so she would say, well, maybe I'll just stay here. And so she would stay there and she would work. And I could see what it was doing to her because she would come home from work every day and just, I mean, just the, the bickering and the trouble that was going on with all these lost women she was working with up there, just, and she just couldn't handle it. And then finally, finally, God really, really hit her hard with it. And I had told her, honey, now, you know, that's your decision. You know, you, you do what you want to do. 
And God smote me. And he said, Mike, be a man. I gave her to you. She is yours. She is under your authority. It is not her decision. It's yours. And I, and I repented. And I went to her and I said, Honey, if you want to quit, go ahead and quit. I said, I'll find something for you to do here. They had just given her, this was August, they had just given her a promotion and a raise, a big one, and it was retroactive to the beginning of the year. In other words, they were going to back up from January to August and pay her what her raise would have been for all eight of those months. Big chunk of change. And God finally, she finally said, I'm quitting, I'm, I'm, I'm done, I'm out of here. And the blessing was is that every time I would leave, now my wife was right there with me and my kids were with me. And I wasn't one of these. I'd run off and leave my family and go all over the place. My, my place was with my wife and my place was with my family. And I was, didn't have to leave them to go minister somewhere. God allowed them to be with me. But there was a place there that was holding her in bondage. And every time she thought about being free, the devil would give her money and then she would submit and I would submit to her being in bondage again. And God dealt with me about that. So there's the spirit that works this thing. If you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. By the way, that is one of the bondages that we can get in is fear. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But you have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. So if you belong to the Lord Jesus, Satan technically has no authority over you. He does not have rights to you. He does not have a right to possess or own any part of you. Okay? Understand that. You belong to the Lord. You do not belong to the devil. You don't owe him anything. You're not paying off some debt. Or you're not serving him to keep his mouth shut about stuff you've been doing. Because one of the things that the devil will do is he will put you in fear and make you think that if you really start living for God and decide to walk away from Him, then He's going to expose you and go start telling everybody what you've been doing. Little terrorist. Exodus chapter, here's what I was getting at a while ago. Exodus chapter 1 verse 13. The Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve. Serve with rigor. And made their lives bitter with hard bondage. Bondage is not fun. I don't care what you're doing. It's not fun. You're in bondage. Bitter with hard bondage in mortar and in brick and all manner of service in the field. And all their service wherein they made them serve was with rigor. They didn't give them a day off. They didn't have unions back then giving them two days off and giving them holiday pay and all that good stuff that we have nowadays. They didn't have any of that stuff and they wanted out. And if you listen to this now, they realized they were not, they did not have the power to make themselves free. Because if they did, they would have left on their own. And you should listen to that. In 2 Peter chapter 2. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. You're in bondage to corrupt things. Things that are decaying. Things that are fading away. You're in bondage to that. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. Because some, some people out there, and I don't know if I'm talking to people here or people across the sea or wherever, you're in bondage to traditions. You're servants of, of things that have passed away and should have passed away a long time ago, and that has and, and what how it used to be has nothing to do with how it is right now in, in real life. For of whom a man has overcome of the same he has brought in bondage. For if after David, now listen to this, here's, here's where you're headed if you don't get set free. For if after they've escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter it is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them to not have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it 
to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them, but it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his old vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. I will tell you what, there's people right now that are that have, have, have been locked in jail for doing heroin, for getting hooked on crack, getting hooked on methamphetamine. They get out of that stuff, and the court appoints them. they got to go to treatment, so they go to the treatment. They get in a little group, and they, they talk about how hard it is to get out of that. And there's people there to try to encourage them and try to get them, you know, hey, let's get straight, you know, let's, you don't need those drugs. And, and they, they finish the program. Boy, it feels real good. Next thing you know, Right back in it. Only this time it's worse. And only this time, instead of going to jail, the judge has decided he's fed up with them. And instead of them getting 30 days lockup, now they're, now they're fixing to get 10 to 12 years. Or worse. If you don't get set free, the latter end is going to be far worse than the beginning was. You believe the Bible? All right. So here's here's where the that was just the setup. Here's the preaching right here. This is where it's going to get a little rough. All right. You may not be able to. I got to put this where I can see it all. You may not be able to see all this up on the screen. Okay. So I'm going to list some types of bondage. Okay. And I'm going to be honest with you. Well, two things I'm going to be honest about. One, there are several things on this list that I thought of you. And there's several things on this list I thought of me. So I'm not exempt, and neither are you. Is that fair enough? All right. Number one, jealousy. Jealousy is bondage. Jealous of brothers and sisters who got treated better in the will than you did. Who cares? Who cares? Jealousy about how some people have, have this and have that and you don't have it. Who cares? You're going to be in bondage. You're going to serve that all of your life. You're always, listen... There's always going to be somebody that you think is better than you or has more than you and it's just going to eat you up. And you're going to try to get more and get what they have and then turn around and they've already left what they had that you wanted and they got something better and now what you've got is no good. Now you want something better. It's bondage, people. And especially right here at Christmas time. It's ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous what this country has turned into at Christmas time. It's pathetic what we've turned into. But it's jealousy. Well, you're see my neighbor's man cave. I mean, they got the big one and they got the honey, they got the fifty-four inch television. I've only got that little forty-nine inch one. Why can't I have that? Jealousy. Jealous that other people do things in the church you think you ought to do. Jealous over silly little silly little issues. It's a type of bondage. Isn't it? Here's another one. Drunkenness is bondage. Amen, Roy? I think Roy's listening. Or any kind of intoxicant. Marijuana is bondage. Heroin's bondage. Methamphetamine is bondage. We saw a gal come in. I said, Lisa, look at that. There's a gal come in Walmart last night. And I'm telling you, she, she had meth written all over her. I mean, she looked sad, pathetic, undernourished. It's awful. And the first thing I thought was, Maybe before all the meth, she might have been a nice looking gal. But that's what it's turned her into. That couple we saw at Arby's last night, Lisa, I think they were high on heroin. It's what they look like. 
they both look stoned out of their mind. And it's, it's absolute bondage. How does it start? How does getting hooked on alcohol start? First drink. How does getting hooked on drugs start? First joint. First hit. First high. Getting high, it works in your brain to where that feeling is so good. And then afterward, you don't feel it anymore, and you'll do anything in the world to get that feeling again. But the problem is, you have to do more and more and more to get the same feeling. Alcohol is the same way. To where anymore, you're not doing heroin and meth and alcohol just to feel good or to feel high. You're doing it just to be normal. And it's bondage. And you're you're not serving the Lord. You're serving something that you're serving another spirit. Anger. Somebody having anger issues is bondage. Everything just trips your trigger. You get angry at this. You get you get angry that your macaroni was in the wrong side of the plate. Salt and pepper wasn't on the table. You get angry because of this. You get angry because of that. And what that is. That anger, that type of anger is a desire for everybody to bow before you. And normally with your anger, people have learned that it's just easier to give in to you than it is to deal with your wrath and your anger. And you think that they're just being normal because they're giving you what you want. But the truth of it is, they're sick and tired of putting up with your anger And they've learned that it's just easier to give in to you and put up with you than it is to stand up to you. Who am I talking to this morning? I don't know. Men have anger issues. Women. Women have anger issues. To be honest with you, sometimes it's more serious in women than it is in men. But it's bondage. Fear is bondage. Fear of everything. I know some people I've counseled with in my life that they're so afraid that God's not pleased and happy with them, they do some of the most ridiculous things as far as Christianity is concerned. And they're constantly, constantly, constantly trying to shape and mold their life and do this and do that and quit this and quit that. Or maybe we should start doing... There was a... I'm not kidding you. There was a pastor that's a friend of mine. His wife took over the church service one morning and made everybody pray and made everybody go down to the altar yelling and screaming in their face at them because that church wasn't spiritual enough. She And what it was, I told her, I said, I said, your problem's not that church. Your problem is you don't feel accepted by God, unless you get this little emotional rush in you, and if you don't get it, you feel like you've dishonored God in some way, and He's not going to have anything to do with you. And I think this goes all the way back to your childhood. Your problem is not its not that you're not saved. Your problem is you're messed up. That's what I told her. But she was in constant fear that God was always angry with her and was going to throw her into hell just like that. And I said, your real problem is you read the Bible, but you don't believe it. Your fear in you is held, holding you in bondage and you don't believe what's plainly written that is by grace that we're saved through faith and not of ourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any, any man should boast. I just want to ask you a question. How many of you are giving a gift to one of your children or grandchildren that you're pretty sure they don't deserve it? I know Lisa and I are. Uh, I mean... Uh, Pride. Pride is bondage. Pride is absolute bondage. Stuck up. Arrogance. 
thinking you're better than everybody else. It is nothing but pure bondage. And you can, you look down your nose at everybody that doesn't, everybody that commits sins that you don't or you say you don't. And let me tell you something. Those people that commit sins that you say you don't do or you think you don't do, I think they're better off than you are with your pride. Because God resists the proud. He gives grace to the humble. I'd rather have to deal with the lust of my flesh and the lust of my eyes than I would have to deal with my pride. But you're in worse bondage than the dope addicts and the whoremongers in our, in our town, in our community. To your own stinking pride. People come in bondage to religion or religious practices. Roman Catholics are in bondage. They're in bondage to the Pope. They're in bondage to the idols. They're in bondage to whatever the bishop tells them, whatever St. Mary tells them. They're in bondage to whatever the priest tells them. And they need to be set free. Amen? They're in bondage, and they don't know it. They don't think they're in bondage. But they're serving idols, and they're serving a man, and they let a church or a man tell them whether or not they're good enough to go to heaven. That's bondage. People, in, people all over the world are in religious bondage everywhere. And these, I want to tell you something. Those, those uh, Saturday church observers, those Seventh-day Adventist people, you're in, you're in worse bondage than, than the worst scumbags I can think of because you think that pleasing God comes by keeping the law, and it doesn't. You cannot please God by law keeping. Um, look at this. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free and be not entangled again in the yoke of bondage. And Paul was talking about, watch this, Bill, I, Paul, say unto you that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For if I testify to you, every man that is circumcised, he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace, he said. Because you think that your own righteousness or your own good deeds or your own... You keep the fourth commandment. Therefore, you're better than everybody else. You're in bondage. Because I want to tell you something. While you, Amen. Jared's getting happy about that. Come on. While you think that God loves you and God favors you because you keep the fourth commandment, you broke, thou shalt not commit adultery with your eyes. You broke, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. You broke, thou shalt not covet with your eyes. You're breaking the law while you're keeping one of them. Oh, good for you. You're in bondage. In bondage to oaths or agreements. Oaths and agreements and or contracts. You sign a contract. Now you have an obligation to do something that maybe, maybe it'll turn out you realize you probably shouldn't do that or don't want to do it. Um, let me throw something else in here. Debt. Debt is bondage. Debt is bondage. You know, let me tell you something. You're going you're gonna to be one of two people. Now you listen to me. This... This is hard, but it's true. You're either going to be so far in debt and then realize that you've got to pay all of that back. You know what some people end up doing? College kids. Credit card companies show up at college campuses because they have kids there that are, a that are able to sign contracts now for the first time in their life. And they can come into contract with a credit card company and they're given a credit card. And these kids now who've never been taught how to handle money and don't have money, they go out and before they ever graduate, they are hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt just to the credit card bill. And there was a documentary done a few years ago and I watched it and it had all these college kid mothers who were telling about how their son blew his brains out 
because the creditors kept coming after him and he couldn't pay the debt and he figured there was no way out. You're, now listen to me. You're either going to be in bondage trying to pay that debt off or you're going to skip out on it and not pay it. Now you're a thief. You stole money from a company that loaned it to you and all that stuff that you've got in your house and your garage is stolen because you skipped out on the debt. You're a thief. And America has a serious problem with debt. No wonder our country is in debt. Its people are seriously in debt. And they either don't know how to pay it back and don't, or they just become thieves. Neither one of them is right. Oaths and agreements, swearing oaths to different organizations, different groups where they require you to do something that you know is not, is not in the Word of God and should not be done. The tongue. 